day, it's David Nabarro talking here. Uh, I am working on uh, the COVID-19 pandemic internationally. I'm working as special envoy for the Director General of the World Health Organization. I'd like to talk about the relationships between COVID and food. First of all, it's absolutely clear that the capacity of bodies to of our bodies to defend themselves against uh, invading viruses depends enormously on the functioning of our immune systems and our immune systems work best when we're well nourished with adequate intake of energy protein and micronutrients and so I'm very much aware that good nutrition is key. I'm also aware that in some people, the virus causes disease through activating a really intense immune response. So I also want to stress that we do need to be aware that in some people, immune hyperactivity can be also associated with suffering uh, in COVID. And that's why sometimes the treatment offered is medicines that will modulate that immune activity. Now, it's reasonable to assume that if a immune response is dependent on good nutrition, that people should be encouraged to consume healthy diets as part of their ability to be strong in the face of COVID. And in fact, I would like to say that there are two key things that I would like people to do. One is to keep themselves strong and healthy, practicing good hygiene and all else that's necessary to maintain the body in good condition. The second is to do everything possible to avoid being caught by the virus. And so that means physical distancing wearing masks, keeping surfaces clean, and isolating yourself if you have symptoms of the disease. Now, I'd have to stress that at the moment, I do not know really what are the important nutritional requirements for protecting uh, against severe illness with COVID. But there are reports suggesting that uh, vitamin D does play an important role. There are other reports suggesting that zinc and vitamin A may be relevant as well. And that's because of their role in ensuring he healthy epithelia. Now, the real relationship between COVID and food comes through the impact of the disease and of containment efforts on people's ability to access the food they need for good nutrition. If containment is associated with widespread movement restrictions, then it gets very difficult for poor people to earn the income they need to live. And if they can't earn income, then they are unable to buy food. If they're unable to buy food, they go hungry. For children, uh, it's high nutrient foods that are particularly important. For adults, it's just the food they need for life. But particularly those who are doing intense work or pregnant women who are eating for themselves and a child is on the way. I would stress that good nutritious, sorry, nutritious foods are absolutely key to making certain that people uh, are able to cope with the containment efforts without experiencing malnutrition. I uh, want to stress this also, that, that, that COVID seems to be particularly affecting poorer people. So that means that if poor people are most at risk, and if poor people also are most affected by the containment measures, like uh, movement restrictions, then this is a particular challenge. And, and I would like to suggest that all responses to COVID should prioritize the interests of, 
those who are poorest. Now it's said that in the confinement, in some parts of the world, people did adopt healthier eating habits. And uh, in particular, this meant that they were more likely to buy food that came from nearby producers. And they were also more likely to cook for themselves rather than to eat out. Now, that seems to have been really important, particularly for people who are in the wealthier income groups. But I want to stress that the confinement has been really difficult for people in poor income groups, especially those whose children depended on school meals for a large proportion of their nutrition. Because if schools were closed, then the nutritious school meals were not available. And that's why I think that we see in some parts of the world, people did get quite nervous when there were shortages of food because of confinement. Indeed, in some places, those who had savings would go out and, and buy uh, in order to keep stocks in their home. Again, you had to be well off to do this. And it did mean that for a period, there were shortages, not just of food, but certain consumable items in shops. And, and, and I think that what it shows us is that people do get naturally, and I want to stress naturally, quite frightened when there is a, a major crisis. They worry that there's going to be a shortage, and so they stockpile. And we've seen reports of stockpiling of protective equipment for health workers and hospitals, of medicines for hospitals, stockpiling of other goods associated with anxiety about border closures and stockpiling of food. And, and I'm not surprised by that. Uh, obviously, one wants to encourage people not to stockpile uh, unless there's a really evident reason for it. But it's a natural tendency that all people uh, and pursue when they are worried. And you only need to get uh, uh, everybody stockpiling, say doubling the amount of stock they keep of certain essential items, and that can lead to shortages, as we saw uh, in Europe, for example, with packaged flour in the recent confinement. I think it's always useful if public organisations help to reassure the public that there's no significant shortage, uh, and that may require quite extensive efforts because rumours about shortages uh, can drive um, purchasing behaviour, uh, and we know that from multiple crises in the past. Now, I want to stress that as we look ahead, there are a number of features of food systems that need attention, and this, these needs have been revealed through COVID. First of all, how do food systems respond to a rapid increase in numbers of poor and hungry people? Answer, it's really essential that there is good social protection and access to nutritious food, particularly for poor people in times of crisis. Secondly, food systems with long supply chains have proved to be particularly susceptible to disruption because in, in a crisis, borders are closed, uh, transportation gets disrupted. So there's a real value in having short supply chains, wherever possible, linking producers to consumers. Thirdly, when producers cannot sell their food, for example, because markets are disrupted, uh, then that creates major problems for them because producers are often in debt. Uh, and it's difficult to get extra loans or to get uh, opportunities to postpone repayment of loans. And yet, if you're a producer and your market for your produce has suddenly disappeared, uh, you don't have a continued income. And during uh, early parts of the confinement that have occurred with COVID, we've heard reports of producers actually having to waste some of their produce deliberately, uh, particularly dairy or vegetables or fruits, uh, simply because they, they couldn't sell them because the demand dried up. This is a major problem. And 
in some countries, a lot of care was given to supporting producers uh, by helping them with cash grants or by enabling them to postpone repayment of loan dues. This is very important because the last thing anybody wants is to see producers' distress increased as a result of the confinement. Fourthly, the world is very dependent on the efforts of local organisations, particularly small enterprises and medium enterprises for the functioning of food systems. And yet, during the confinement process earlier this year, a lot of small and medium enterprises faced really difficult financial situations. And we're hearing reports that there's been large numbers of bankruptcies. This is not good for food systems. And I, I do hope that everybody concerned will look very hard at the situation of small and medium enterprises involved in food systems and just check uh, that they have got as much protection as possible. Uh, often cash grants can make a lot of difference, uh, especially if an SME is in trouble. And that applies to small companies involved in catering, involved in restoration, restauranting, I mean, are also involved in food processing. I'd like to add one extra postscript. We've seen during this crisis that workers in cold factories, and that's, I want to stress that food processing factories are often cold, running at between four degrees and 10 degrees centigrade. But workers in these factories seem to have had a rather high uh, incidence of COVID particularly when they're close together, for example, in meat processing or fish processing. And there's been a really very high level of, of infection rates in these institutions. Uh, that suggests to me that these need to get special attention, uh, really for the sake of the workers. Uh, you can keep production going, of course, which is important for the, um, the production companies and also those who are supplying raw material into the food production factories, such as live animals or perishable goods. But uh, you need to pay special attention to the well-being of the workers in these situations and make absolutely clear to them that you'll support them if they take time off because they suspect they might have been exposed. In this way, you can prevent clusters of COVID from building up in the factories. These clusters don't just affect the people in the factories, they also might lead to virus being taken into the places where workers live. And there are uh, quite a number of, of instances now of situations where cold food processing plants have been a major source of local infection in particular parts of the world, uh, actually all over the world, but particularly where these large food processing plants operate with workers very close together. Thank you very much, Chuck, for the chance to answer these questions.